Bernie Sanders sat down for an interview with the Washington Post where he discussed the single most important issue. The, the issue here, and maybe, you know, we can talk about health care, we can talk about education, we can talk about women's rights. At the end of the day, my friends, the most important issue is campaign finance reform. Because so long as you continue to have a handful of billionaires like the Koch brothers, Sheldon Adelson, and others who can dump huge amounts of money into a Senate race, a congressional race, a governor's race, we're not going to have the kind of democracy that this country deserves. If you look at what goes on in the Senate where I live or in the House, what you find is that virtually every major piece of legislation that comes to the floor is paid for by wealthy and powerful special interests. And in fact, in many cases, whether it's trying to throw 32 million people off of health insurance or give tax breaks to billionaires, it is exactly the opposite of what the American people want. So we have to deal with campaign finance. From the dilemma, obviously, is you can say, oh, well, you know, and I ran without a super PAC, and that's the way I will always run. Our campaign was dependent upon several million small in individual con contributions averaging $27. The dilemma out there is people can say, well, you know, I don't want, I did it, you know, and I will always do that. But, you know, people say, well, it's kind of unilateral disarmament. The Koch brothers pouring in huge amounts of money. So. All right. So there's a few different points there that, that I want to hit on. Now, obviously, up front, Bernie Sanders is exactly right about campaign finance reform. Campaign finance reform is the most important issue because until you have fair elections, until you have public financing of elections, you're going to continue to have this system where the 1% and multinational corporations have a lot more influence on the politicians that get elected than the average person does. So, for example, right now, all across the country in, in America, you see these candidates winning primaries primarily because they had the most money behind them. Now, luckily, progressives have managed to make some gains uh, despite that. But by and large, there are a lot of Democratic candidates winning primary races because they had the most money behind them. And that money is coming from multinational corporations and billionaires. And what do you think happens once they get in? That money has an effect on the bills that come to the floor and how they vote. So, I mean, th this stuff, I hope, is obvious at this point. These billionaires and these, these massive corporations are not giving money, are not giving millions of dollars to candidates for fun. They're doing it because they get a return on their investment. If that candidate wins, then, that, then they have a voice within Congress or within a, 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 state, um, a state Senate to influence what happens in that state or in the country. So this at this point, I hope everyone understands that, that money has destroyed politics. And that, that is why campaign finance reform is the most important issue. Now, um, Bernie mentioned there how he ran on uh, the average of... $27 a piece when he ran for president. Now, that is a strategy that works a lot better if you run for president. So because Bernie's race was national, he's getting money from all over the country to help support his race. So in that sense, if you're running for president, I mean, in 2020, if you are taking PAC money and there are there super PACs supporting you, you you're dumb. <laughs> you have to run a race that is free of of billionaire money and of uh of, of massive corporation money if you don't do that i'm going to tell you right now you're not going to win the democratic primary you need to actually fight for campaign finance reform and show that you were not influenced by multinational corporations or the one percent so bernie sanders right now if he runs in 2020 i mean it's over he he, he has the nomination but if you are trying to be progressive if you're someone like a like Kamala Harris or Cory Booker, and you're taking in corporate PAC money, they've said they, they, they're going to stop. But if they still have super PAC supporting them, and they're still taking in or they're still going to those, um, the dinners where it's like a 1000 bucks a plate. These aren't people that represent you. So you have to vote for people that represent you. And the only way to know if somebody represents you is by not taking in that sort of money. Now, obviously, because of that, there's going to be some bruises for progressives in the meantime. If you have, have a, a progressive going up against a Democratic uh, establishment candidate that is taking in thousands of dollars from, from special interests, it's an uphill battle. But it's a battle that you can win. And even if you don't win this election, you can win next time. 
So progressives, while they don't have the, the money advantage, at least in, in smaller races, they do have the ground game advantage. You can get more volunteers, knock on more doors, call more houses. There are ways that you can get around that, the lack of money. That said, obviously, money has a massive influence on who wins these elections, and it's going to take some time to, to fight that. But you have to run principally and run without taking that large amount of money. Now, um, let me go to this next clip here where they talk about an example of how money has affected politics. I mean, one of the striking things recently was when they rolled back Dodd-Frank, the bill that was passed yep. to prevent another financial crisis. 17 Democrats voted for that piece of legislation, uh, even more in the House. Uh, is, I mean, is, it, are things like that going to happen until there's campaign finance reform? Is that an example of a special I think that is. That is. I mean, at the end of the day, it, it, it's not complicated. I mean, politics really is not. Look, people disagree. That's called democracy. That's a good thing. Let's treat each other in a civil way. You disagree with me, and that's fine. But at the end of the day, you want a government which represents ordinary people, the needs of ordinary people, rather than the needs of a handful of billionaires. And when folks say, well, you know, I need that vote from you, and, and you want campaign contributions, you want help from my super PAC, I will expect you to vote to deregulate Wall Street. Well, people will do that, unfortunately. So this is a perfect example of how money has affected politics. Deregulating the banks. Did any Democrat run on deregulating the banking industry? Did Mark Warner, who voted for that, that legislation to roll back Dodd-Frank, did, the, the, did he run on the idea that he's going to deregulate the banks? No. So why did he do it? Because he gets tons of money from Wall Street. All the Democrats that voted for that bill get a lot of money from Wall Street. And how does, how does Wall Street get the return on investment? When these Democrats, because of the, the money they, they took in from Wall Street, go out and vote to deregulate their banks. Done. That's how they do it. So this idea, like, this is... When you see a politician like this, someone like Mark Warner, who is just in bed with all big money... You have to vote these people out. It's that simple. Now, <laughs> voting them out is less simple, but if you can vote them out, you get a lot closer to a system, at least to a party, that'll better represent people and will be more appealing to voters. But right now, a lot of voters see two parties that are both corrupted, and they don't bother voting at all. So voter turnout is the biggest issue right now affecting the Democratic Party. And how can they help that? They can help that by taking big money out of politics and showing that the Democratic Party actually represents their best interests. Now, this last clip here I want to show is um, Bernie talking about how this system of money has affected what politicians spend their time on. You mentioned the kind of the oligarchy. You even mentioned Disney. Bob Iger, the CEO who got the deal you talked about. His I didn't kind of mention Jeff Bezos. Did, you all heard that? <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't do that. Here. Uh, I don't uh, want to. I don't want to embarrass uh, right. uh, Bob Iger, Mark Cuban, Howard Schultz, Sheryl Sandberg. You know, there, you have all these sort of millionaire, billionaire, plutocrat Democrats who are, you know, Tom Steyer, thinking about getting involved in the process. Some of them probably share your views on a lot of issues, but can also, you know, aren't necessarily proven progressives and have the ability to cut these huge checks. Do you worry about kind of the... We, we can talk about the Koch brothers and Sheldon Adelson all day, but that we're seeing more of these yeah. people emerge. I mean, on, I do uh, look. I mean, the truth is, and it is, it is, and, and I see among my colleagues, good people, spending half, and they'll be the first to admit it to you, mm -hmm. spending half of their lives not dealing with their constituents, not studying up on the issues. They're on the damn phone, and they hate it. Yeah. But that's the system that we are in right now. We are moving toward a system where especially if you are in a large state, you're going to have to be either dependent upon billionaire contributors or be a billionaire yourself. Does anybody really think this is what American democracy is supposed to be about? So yes, I, I do. Look, there are, there are billionaires out there who are very decent people, who are smart people, or well-intentioned people. But they shouldn't have the right to run for office any more than a working stiff who is also decent and bright but can't afford to raise the millions of dollars that is needed for a campaign. So yeah, I do have real concerns about yeah. that. All right, so a few things here. First, I love that jab at the beginning at Jeff Bezos. So Jeff Bezos, 
bought the Washington Post for $250 million. And he's one of the billionaires that Bernie Sanders has been going after online. So Jeff Bezos, if you don't know, runs Amazon. Now, Jeff Bezos, his Amazon workers, his warehouse workers, a lot of them are living off food stamps because they aren't making a living wage. Now, how does that make any sense? Jeff Bezos, worth $130 billion, is not paying his warehouse employees a living wage. So they're forced to live off food stamps that are being that are taxpayer funded. Now, I have no issue with food stamps. I mean, a safety net exists for a reason. But if you have a full-time job, you should be able to be making you should be able you should be making enough money to afford food. Especially if your CEO is a billionaire. This is just obvious. So this is not people talk about, you know, the free market. Is this the free market? Is this what you want? You want one person worth $130 billion while his workers are living off taxpayer-funded subsidies? Is that your idea of a utopia? You need a system that is properly regulated so that people are making, if you work 40 hours a week, you do make a living wage and you're not, have, you're not having to rely on uh, public services to get by. I mean, this is just obvious. Now, Bernie mentioned how there are decent billionaires. And yeah, there there likely is. I, I mean, I, <laughs> I can't think of any, but maybe there is. But um, he said there, look, even if there is a progressive billionaire that wants to pour money into elections for progressives, he's against it. And I completely agree with him. Regardless of where your politics is, you shouldn't be having more influence on elections than the average person. So this is a principled position. I don't care if you are super right wing. I don't care if you're super left wing. You shouldn't be putting more money or you shouldn't, you shouldn't have more influence on elections than the average person does. This is why moving to a public finance, uh, public financing of elections makes sense because then you move to a system that properly represents everyone. Now, um, the last thing here. So if progressives can't take in or shouldn't be taking in this sort of money, how do they win? You have to win on the messaging. You have to win with your ground game. So knock on doors, call people, uh, have a platform and, and message it in, in, a, in a way that, that connects with people. That's how you win. And yes, there's going to be a lot of losses. So, you know, oftentimes the, the person that has the most money behind them is the one that wins the election. But you can change that. We can move to a system where we start electing uh, uncorrupted people to Congress and to, to state races uh, as well. Elect these people and then show, show your community how you, how you lead as a politician that is not corrupted. How you lead as somebody who is actually listening to your community. Who doesn't spend all his time calling up billionaires and, and uh, wealthy individuals to get their campaign contributions. Politicians shouldn't be spending their time calling people for money. I mean, that alone shows you how broken this system is. So if progressives can lead on the messaging and uh, lead on in terms of um, not taking in these large campaign donations, then it shows that you are uncorrupted and you begin to build a movement for your campaign. And yes, you may lose a few races, but... This is what has, what has to be done in order to make the progress that is needed.